Thank you everyone for coming to our webinar today. We're going to be covering Yes, You Can Scan and more, talking about what fair use allows in the short-term emergency to meet the needs of, teach of students and what it will allow you to do going forward. Before we get into that though, I want to start with a discussion of where our students are right now in this emergency. And the speakers for the first part of this webinar will touch on some vulnerable student populations who face unequal experiences in the regular experience of school and who are disproportionately impacted by this emergency, which we think is important so that as you go into this effort to reach students whose education is disrupted, that we have a broad and representative picture of the challenges that those students face every day at school and how those challenges are exacerbated in this emergency. Um, we're going to introduce each panelist as they uh, begin to speak, but first I'll just let you know who I am. My name is Meredith Jacob. I'm uh, the director of the Creative Commons USA project at American University Washington College of Law, and I'm a copyright lawyer who spends a lot of time talking to teachers and educators about how they shouldn't worry too much about copyright and how they should sort of put their teaching mission first. And our first presenter who I'm lucky to work with on a lot of this, these projects is Christina Ishmael. She serves as the senior project manager of the teaching, learning and tech team for the education policy program at New America. Before joining New America, Christina was the K through 12 open education fellow at the office of ed tech at the US Department of Education. And before that, she worked as the digital learning special specialist for the Nebraska Department of Education, as well as experience as a classroom teacher. Christina, thanks for joining us. Of course, thanks for having me. Um, this is something that is actually near and dear to my heart, um, just being a, a former classroom teacher, as well as providing a lot of professional development on this across the state of Nebraska whenever I was in that role, but then continuing to talk about this when it comes to open educational resources and a lot of the work that we do at New America around instructional materials. Um, but first, I want to say that we know that everyone is doing the very best that they can right now. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in this topic. Um, I know that I've been tweeting a lot lately. And I just want to say that like, um, we know that this is emergency learning. We know that this is triage learning. This is not necessarily a, a typical distance education scenario or even online learning. And so thank you for doing what you're doing and trying to provide um, the best possible outcomes for your students. Um, so in my work at New America, um, we I get to work with really, really smart people. Um, one of them is Elena Silva, who is our director of our pre-K-12 program. And she talks a lot about students with disabilities. And I've learned a lot from her over the past couple of years. And she really wanted to emphasize what this means um, in a time of this emergency or triage learning, um, what this means for students with disabilities. Um, and we'll also talk about other vulnerable populations, which is why uh, uh, we're kind of starting with the scope and the context of all of this. So what I've learned, I've learned from her as well as my, my classroom experience. But I think it's really important to kind of set the stage with how many uh, children we're actually talking about and students with disabilities. And so on the next slide, we have um, the actual number, which is 14% of our 50.5 million public school students in uh, K through 12, or 7 million of our students that are identified with some sort of mental, physical, emotional, or behavioral disability, and they receive special education services in our public school system. Again, this does not account for private, independent, or charters, but this is uh, data from National Center on Educational Statistics out of the, uh, excuse me, out of the Department of Education. And I think it's also really important to kind of preface that when you have someone that is identified with special needs or a student with a disability, that they fall kind of typically into two different categories. And that is within the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA, um, which is ensuring a fair and appropriate public education. Uh, that means that that lends itself to an IEP, which is a whole plan and process for a child's special education experience. Um, it is a very cumbersome process. Uh, if you've ever had to go through that, if you've ever known someone that's gone through that. Uh, however, it makes sure that we can ensure uh, a really specific type of experience for students with disabilities in their school, uh, school lives. Then you also have Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which came out a little bit later than IDEA. 
And that led to 504 plans, which are a little different than IEPs. Um, so that is more of a blueprint or plan for how the school will provide support kind of writ large within the whole uh, school experience. Um, and then they will try to remove barriers for any type of student with disabilities. And going back to that first bullet point, we look at mental, physical, emotional, and behavioral disabilities. So not simply a learning disability, a speech disability, um, anything like that, but that it's actually looking at all types of things. Especially right now, um, we have a lot of students that are dealing with external factors um, that we are, are completely out of our control, um, but that it's really important that we are making sure uh, we're addressing that whenever we first start to think about our our students. And um, again, I, I thank you for addressing this and then starting with kind of the scope and the context of where we are. Um, and I know that Kelly is going to talk about um, some more students that this affects next. Great, thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker is Kelly Hurst. Kelly Hurst is the founder and director of Being Black at School which is an organization she founded after spending 23 years in the public education system as a teacher, liter literacy coach, guidance dean, and assistant principal, witnessing firsthand how the system was helping white students thrive while continuing to marginalize black students. Kelly, thank you so much for being here today and for talking a little bit about what we need to think about to make sure that um, the inequities faced by students of color is not ignored in this emergency transition. Thank you. And of course, um, I have children here who just started crying as soon as it was my turn. Um, and I know everybody will understand that. Um, so I um, run Being Black at School, which we use data analysis and policy analysis for parents and um, teachers and school administrators. And uh, the role of race, one of the things that we don't need right now, um, including for this particular panel, is more data because we already have the data that tells us that schools are inequitable, that schools um, have continued to marginalize black students, other students of color, uh, probably the largest population by percentage is actually indigenous students, and that the outcome for students right now is actually exacerbated. The, the thing that we have learned is that all of our safety social nets have wide, wide gaps in them, and this will continue to increase. Um, we're already hearing from students who are talking about not being able to access technology not being able to access um, internet services. Uh, school systems are trying to uh, provide students with a whole lot of uh, technology that is, is brand new for some of their families, but um, our communities are actually hurting even more. And so any of the, uh, for example, social determinants of health that are harmful to black communities are actually magnified right now. We have a very sharp lens on what this is looking like in major cities. Uh, I live very close to St. Louis, where almost 100% of the deaths have been African Americans who live in places where environmental concerns have long been an issue. Um, and so in order to help frame this conversation for you all, um, what are the things that we do at Cross Roads uh, and at Being Black at School is called a power analysis where we're looking at power. So here's how I would like for you all to think about this. I want you to ask yourselves two questions as you're moving forward. Whatever it is you're going to implement, who is going to be helped by it? And then ask this, who's going to be harmed? And if you can answer that second question, it means that we can't implement something. It means we have to go back to the drawing board and we have to think about the ways in which these marginalized communities that are already feeling a whole lot of pain are going to be able to actually um, access all of the things that we want them to access. This includes um, how we talk to teachers, how we talk to school systems, and how we ensure that they understand that if we don't do this the right way, we're going to continue to harm our students. Um, so the role of race obviously plays a huge, a huge role in um, our school systems. It has, we are, we are far more segregated now than we were uh, during Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s. Um, so our school systems are desperately in need of some help. And um, this is one way to give it to them so that students and families can actually access this. So again, those two questions are who's going to be helped and who's going to be harmed. It doesn't matter which order you ask them in, but ask the question. Thank you very much. And um, I wanted to note that we're going to be working with Kelly to run a deep dive webinar on thinking through these issues of equity for black students and students of color 
and thinking as you look at your implementation in the fall going forward as we continue to work in an uncertain educational environment what we are doing in those situations to create materials and to implement materials that uh, take into account this structural inequality and um, that will be in um, May it'll be May 22nd the third Friday in May and we'll send email out to this group of participants about how to access that um, Thank you very much. I know she has to go. Um, up next, we have Jenny Munoz. Jenny is a former bilingual teacher who's an education policy analyst at uh, New America, where she researches and reports on policies and practices related to English language learners, culturally responsive education, and educational equity. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for that introduction, Meredith. Um, I'm going to be spotlighting some of the issues that are specifically affecting English learners, and some of these will have I think a direct link to our topic today. So here are some things that we know about English learners. There's 4.9 million L's in the US and increasingly they are being enrolled in districts that have never enrolled L's before. So even before Corona, people were grappling with how to meet the needs of this population. Um, we know that L's are more likely to come from low income households and because of this, they are less likely to have high speed internet or have multiple devices at home. Uh, we also know that um, Spanish speaking homes are more likely to access the internet through mobile devices. Um, the largest population of L's comes from Spanish speaking homes, so we really need to be considering uh, whether or not the tools that we're choosing to send home are accessible on mobile, whether or not we are sharing um, information on how to access online learning um, in a PDF format in a way that can be accessed on mobile. Uh, we should be thinking about, um, you know, if we're sending out surveys, can these be opened up on somebody's phone? Um, we also know that, and I, and I think it's so important to mention that because a uh, majority of L's families come from low income households, that some of these families might be on the front lines, they might be working, and they might be unable to co-facilitate learning or create a learning environment or establish consistent routines for their students. And I think we just have to come uh, and give families a lot of grace during this time, um, readjusting the workload to ensure that, you know, what we're expecting of students is reasonable and that we're really balancing what they're expected to do independently versus with the support of somebody at home. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we also know, of course, that, you know, some else comes from families that are not proficient in English and may be un unable to understand online assignments or any instructions for how to use technology. And so um, it is already schools are legally required to translate um, information about coronavirus and what they're doing to address it to families. But this should really also extend to um, translating the um, assignments that we're sending home. So for example, like a parent may very well be able to help on a math assignment if the instructions are translated, right? So that's something that we should be thinking about, you know, in addition to what is required, what, we, what can we do to improve the access so that they are actually supporting in the best way that they can. Um, another thing that we know from the literature is that families might be afraid to ask for things in their native language. Again, it is required if a parent um, asks for translation services, it is required, but they don't always do and they don't always um, communicate that they actually would love somebody to talk to about an issue that they're going through. So it's important to reach out to parents about what it is that they need. Um, I know that some districts are using bilingual liaisons who are calling and texting and connecting with parents about things that they might need so that they feel comfortable asking for things in their native language. Um, and then finally, we also have a large group of parents that are, you know, newcomer families that have recently arrived immigrants who may not know, already not understand the U.S. schooling system and the expectations. And so reaching out to them, again, in ways that they, that you can connect via phone and via text, whether it's a teacher or a bilingual liaison that might be able to, you know, talk to parents during this time about what they should be doing on their end to support their student. Uh, and then on the last slide, um, I just wanted to highlight a few things that are specific to teachers and instruction in the classroom. Already, there is a lack of digital instructional materials in some of the prime languages for English learners. And so um, we talk a lot about the invisible labor that a lot of bilingual teachers do already translating uh, resources, particularly for dual language students who you know, have to be taught in, um, in their home language or partner language during a part of the day. 
Um, and so I think this brings up some questions that hopefully we can answer in the rest of the presentation about copyright and what we can and can't be translating. Um, but that's something to think about that teachers in many ways are already doing this. And so now we're sort of having to do this even more as we have to share these resources that have to be in digital form in some cases. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to end with, which I think is very, very important, is that, you know, even during a time of digital learning, we should try to figure out how we're leveraging our tools to ensure that English learners are still practicing these four domains of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So how can we best get students to continue to talk to one another? How can we get students to write and receive feedback? Um, I'm already hearing conversation around, you know, during this urgent time, people are saying that maybe we should focus on content instruction and language instruction will come after that. But it's so important to think about these two things as happening simultaneously. Um, and in some cases, I think learning from home and, and, and using um, distance learning can actually benefit students because a lot of the strategies for learning language, whether it's um, showing students visuals or videos, um, or actually something that we can obviously do online. And again, some of the copyright implications we can touch on later. But the big takeaway message here is that we cannot prioritize content instruction over language instruction, because that's the sort of thing that would lead to even greater equity gaps like once we come back into the fall. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, and so as we heard from both uh, Jenny and Kelly, one cross-cutting source of inequality can be uh, the digital divide, can be lack of access either through bandwidth issues or through devices or through parents' ability to help out with technology. And so to talk about that issue, we have um, Robert Dillon. Robert Dillon is an author, speaker, and educator who's 20 plus years in education, have seen him serve kids and families as a teacher, a principal, and a technology director. Right now, he's serving as the Director of Innovative Learning at the School District of University City in St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, Meredith, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I, I think uh, delivery service is the next thing I need to add to my bio. Um, yeah. Uh, before I jump in, uh, I should mention that uh, here at the School District of University City in St. Louis, Missouri, about 80% of our families are impacted by poverty. Um, and, you know, Kelly and Jenny definitely hit on pieces of that, but I want to uh, tell a specific story and then I'll make a few points. I talked to a grandmother earlier this morning that said, um, we need your help. Um, my family, uh, my grandkids, my daughter have just moved into my house and we don't have a way for them to do their work here. Um, and, and I said, okay, we're happy to help. What's that look like? And she said, uh, I don't have internet. They had internet at their apartment, but we don't have internet at my house. So the family actually had to leave their access to go to another place because they couldn't afford the rent there. They could afford the Wi-Fi, but now they can't afford the rent. So that happened. And then uh, the grandmother said, I, I hate to do this to you, but the devices that um, you gave to the students, that was fabulous, that was tremendous, um, they were stolen. Uh, they came here to live over the weekend, they went back to get their stuff, and some things were taken out of their apartment. And so we are seeing um, all of those cases and more. And I think right now, that's what our families are going through. A, they're trying to be uh, fed and make sure their nutritional needs are met, but then there are both chronic and acute issues around access. Uh, and I know this is impacting in rural spaces, but um, certainly in urban spaces and certainly families in poverty that are shifting and moving um, uh, is a huge problem. So right now um, we are doing our best to serve our families and try to get them uh, wireless access. Um, you know, some of the major ISPs have made claims that they're helping and serving families. I know they want to, uh, but in practicality, it is folks like myself and um, others that are just turning 200 classrooms into 1800 classrooms. And I think if you think of it that way, as we talk about copyright later, we're basically taking all of the classrooms we had uh, and turning them into every house in our district or in our area is its own classroom that needs access, that needs technology, that needs content. Um, we have completely uh, off the charts the number of classrooms we have going right now. 
Um, and really from our standpoint, it's all about barriers, right? Like how do we get rid of barriers? How do we make sure people don't have to sign up for things and sign off on things and work with customer service? We just want to make sure that when people have needs, we can meet them because we know that every hour that a student isn't working in our district is an opportunity for them to lose interest in school, uh, slide backwards and negatively impact them whenever we return to school. And so right now we're in that mode, right? Emergency mode. And we're telling teachers, no matter what, get families what they need electronically. And so we've been doing big pieces of that and teachers have had to adapt. They had to say like, well, I had this great document, I had this great software, but it doesn't work on a tablet. It doesn't work on a phone. And so we're having to be really creative about not only getting folks the access they need, which doesn't mean they have access check mark. It means that um, now we have four kids in a house video streaming at the same time. We need that level of internet in houses. Um, and so that's another whole level that we're working on. And you know, then there's also uh, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles that are trying to be their own tech directors. How do I log into this? How do I figure that out? So lots of that context, I think, is a part of this conversation is that um, this is a uh, unfolding um, uh, just need for our families, both on the access side, the connectivity side, and the understanding side of technology. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll come back a little bit later and talk about how some of those questions are partly about technology providing you know, a lot of access and bandwidth, but also about the copyright side of thinking, can we make versions of this that are lower bandwidth? Can we make versions that work asynchronously? What can you do to reduce the, the need to be online 100% and still deliver effective education? Yeah, thanks, Meredith, yes. Thank you. Um, and so using that initial framing to think through these challenges that students are facing, um, we're gonna move into talking about sort of what copyright allows you to do and how the copyright system um, is designed to enable teaching and learning practices. And when we do that, it's important to think through not only sort of targeting the, the, you know, the main group of your students, but making sure that you reach all students, that you're not reaching most of those students. And to talk about uh, the copyright background, we have Will Cross, Will is a lawyer and librarian and serves as the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at the NC State University Libraries. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Meredith, and thank you to all our speakers for those, those powerful stories. That theme of this idea that, that students and educators are facing acute concerns in light of the pandemic, but that those issues are really exacerbating chronic issues for so many vulnerable students and educators is, is really, really powerful. Uh, it breaks my heart that for too many educators and administrators, copyright can wrongly be understood as a further barrier, that it's just like one more hoop we have to jump through, one more thing we've got to get over. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I want to make sure we have sort of a shared vocabulary around sort of what copyright is and how it works. But in particular, I want to suggest two things. One, I want to suggest that copyright loves and supports educators. And if the message you're hearing is copyrights getting in the way of your education, you should be suspicious of that message. You should say, I don't think that's what copyright's for. Let's talk some more about that. And then second, I want to suggest that fair use is one of the most powerful tools we have for making sure that copyright serves its intended purpose of supporting access, teaching, and learning in this moment and every day as well. So starting with sort of the overview when the slide is up, thank you so much for that. Um, if you were able to attend our Copyright Basics webinar earlier in the week, or if you go back to it at some point, you've heard us say this, but I wanna say it again. Copyright is really about balance as much it is, as it is about anything. Um, and the way the structure of copyright is about balance is that the scope of copyright, the stuff that can be protected is very broad, but the way copyright controls access and use is limited in some really significant ways. So I want to talk about the fundamentals of copyright in that context of balance. So the broad, the big, the wide ranging piece of copyright is that it covers a lot of stuff. If something is original, creative, and fixed in a medium where, that, where other people can see it or engage with it, it's very potentially uh, subject to copyright. We generally talk about that in terms of literary works, artistic works, musical works, that kind of thing. But but there's, there's a lot of stuff in the world that copyright touches in some way. 
Um, it's also broad in that it happens automatically and it lasts a long time. Uh, you might know that copyright generally lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years or 95 for an institutional author. So what that means is that if you are sort of listening to this webinar and you're also back channeling on Twitter and going, oh my God, this copyright stuff is so boring. You have these powerful stories and now this lawyer dude won't shut up about the law. Good news, you're a rights holder. You own copyright in that tweet or in that comment or in that whatever. Um, so copyright is incredibly broad in that it protects all that stuff, whether or not you mean it to, whether or not you register it or put a little circle C on it, etc. Um, I did want to say though that copyright is long. It lasts a long time, but not forever. And that really is a feature, not a bug of copyright. Um, when I say that copyright loves and supports education and learning and the public good, um, the fact that copyright expires is really the point. Um, the reason that we have copyright is a short-term incentive uh, to stock a robust public domain that in sort of a, a cheeky way of saying it, that like Lana Del Rey, copyright is born to die. Um, so that's the broad piece, right? That copyright touches a lot of things. The narrow piece though is that copyright has a substantial number of really significant limitations and exceptions. So limitations first. Um, copyright gives a rights holder an exclusive right to control certain activities that third parties might do to reproduce, to make derivative works, to sell, to distribute to the public, to perform or display publicly, that sort of thing. But it's not a total, if you have copyright, nobody can do anything with it, right? So a lot of music that's protected by copyright, I can still sing in the shower and I don't have to get like a special shower singing license to sing a popular song in the shower. That's not one of the exclusive rights, singing in the shower, right? Um, similarly, copyright scope is limited in that it doesn't protect functional concepts, names, facts, ideas, a lot of works of the federal government, et cetera. So there are huge areas where the system was designed to say like, copyright doesn't belong there. Nobody gets to own that idea. So for educators, that generally means that a lot of the work that we do and a lot of the materials that we use in the classroom are not completely locked down by copyright. The easy example here is if you have a worksheet that's, that you use as part of your teaching and learning, um, the idea for the worksheet, the concepts being presented, aren't protected by copyright. Um, and even things like the written instructions may not be protectable under a nerdy thing called the merger doctrine, but this idea that copyright doesn't lock down the ideas that you're presenting to people or even certain aspects of the way you present those ideas. So limitations in, in what is protected and how it can be controlled is one big area where copyright is balanced. The other big area where copyright is balanced, and we're gonna talk a lot more about this now, is there are a whole suite of exceptions where Congress and the courts and the other lawmakers have sort of come together and said, copyright would just get in the way here, right? Copyright is supposed to create a limited monopoly in certain ways, but if you're an educator, if you're a librarian, if you're doing this, this, or this, if we applied copyright in a strict way in this space, it would get in the way of rather than furthering the aims of copyright. So we're just gonna carve out a space. Uh, and the one educators deal with most option, often is in section 110.1 of the Copyright Act, um, the classroom, the face-to-face -face teaching exception uh, that says it is not a violation of copyright to perform or display a legal copy of a work as part of face-to-face -face instruction. Just full stop, copyright is a thing, except in this protected sacred space of the classroom, don't worry about copyright, do your society serving work. As a librarian, section 108 is where a lot of my work lives, um, and there are, there are these for uh, religious organizations, for agricultural gatherings, for a lot of different specific areas, there are specific exceptions where these people doing these things, don't worry about copyright, let's be clear about that. In addition to those specific exceptions, the thing we're gonna be talking about for the next at least 10 or 15 minutes, if not more than that, is this sort of exceptional exception of fair use. Um, and actually, let's go to the next slide to talk a little bit more about fair use. Um, fair use is distinct from those specific exceptions in that it's not written with a particular group of people doing a particular set of things in mind. Instead, fair use is designed as sort of the safety valve for unenumerated, unanticipated, socially valuable uses. And those uses might be unanticipated because they weren't expected by our 1970s Congress, right? Technology that didn't exist in the 70s 
they couldn't have written a specific exception for reading aloud online, for example, so, so fair use fills that gap, right? Um, they might be unanticipated because the sort of people who were involved in the legislative process didn't understand or expect certain types of uses. Even today, we might not expect Congress to write a robust fan fiction exception in the Copyright Act, but that's a thing that fair use supports in really powerful and robust ways, even though the sort of people who tend to be in Congress aren't the sort of people who think about those sorts of uses. Um, and then finally, unanticipated uh, because of emergency, spontaneous need, etc. Right. So in this moment, it would be hard to write a a specific exception for what if there's a coronavirus, right? So fair use fills that gap as well because the statute is out of date in some way, because the decision makers didn't think or just couldn't possibly enumerate, and then because of exceptional circumstances. And we're gonna talk about each of those in a little bit more. Um, but I wanted to note first that one of the reasons that fair use has become really the touchstone for a lot of the copyright stuff that educators do um, is because it is this sort of equitable exception. It's designed to be flexible in the ways that we've talked about. It actually begins not in Congress with the statute, but it begins in the courts. It's written into the, into the 1976 Act and is written in the Act. Um, you have sort of the famous four fair use questions, the what, why, how, and how much economic effect stuff. Um, and there's this sort of early period of finding its way in the 1980s where courts really hit those four factors hard and they often focused most on that fourth factor, the sort of economic harm. But since the 90s, fair use has emerged as one of the most important tools for education and as surprisingly one of the most consistent tools for supporting education. Um, and that might be surprising in that oftentimes when you hear discussions about fair use, you hear a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's uncertain, it's scary, it's just the right to hire a lawyer, you hear that thing. But I wanna suggest, and then John and Brandon and Meredith and Peter and others are gonna say more about why it's more powerful and a lot more consistent than the naysayers might suggest to you. So let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about uh, how we discuss fair use today. So if you look at the statute, you've got that four questions that you, you might have seen in other presentations in the past. Since the early 90s, courts have often sort of synthesized those four questions into these two real core questions. One, are you doing something new or different? Something a court might call transformative with the material. And if you are, are you using the appropriate amount, and that could be part of, or in many cases, the appropriate amount is the entire work, um, to do your transformative sort of society serving thing? If the answer is yes to both, then it's very unlikely this is gonna be a substitute, looking at the fourth factor, and almost certainly your work is gonna be found to be a fair use. If you're reading a copyright case and you see this transformative use at the top, you can often sort of skip down to the bottom and say, oh, I think I know how this story is gonna end. Um, I also wanna note that there is plenty of use that is fair even outside of this question of transformativeness. That is to say, if a use is transformative, very likely fair use, um, but our friends down the road at Georgia State have been dealing with an e-reserves case where the use wasn't necessarily transformative, but a lot of those uses were still fair. So if it's transformative, hooray, very likely fair use. If it's not transformative, that doesn't mean no, it's not fair use. That just means we're gonna have to look a little bit more closely. So that's the way to think through fair use, this powerful sort of wide ranging uh, exception to support societally valuable purposes. It's particularly strong when your use is transformative and using those two core questions, which are the same questions we would ask a good student or a good instructor. Do I hear your voice shining through or are you just ripping somebody else off and not bringing your own creativity or doing something new, right? So that's sort of the what of fair use. Let's talk about how fair use often sort of looks in practice on the next slide. Uh, these are some examples of fair use in action. Um, we've identified these in particular because these are either explicit, explicitly included in the statute or we could point to specific uh, cases where courts have ruled in this area. Um, but again, these are the sort of things that you would expect to happen in a, in a good teacher's classroom or a good student's assignment. We're subjecting works to critique or analysis. We're illustrating arguments. Uh, we're copying to promote accessibility or for language learning, some of those themes that were sounded a little bit earlier on, supporting media literacy and on down the line. If you're doing those sorts of things, you should feel really, really confident about your fair use analysis. Um, and as I say, those are illustrative, not, that's not the whole list. Those are the sort of things that you can feel very confident about. Um, that's not to say that fair use is a get out of jail free card. So on the next slide, we have a couple of not no's, but caution flags. Like you're, you're moving into a little bit more uncharted ter territory. So be a little more careful. If you're doing things like 
Uh, making a use designed mainly to set a mood or to grab attention. This is more because I think it's pretty than because it actually serves my pedagogical purpose. Fair use, you know, not quite as powerful there. Um, if you're making a use that's not proportionate, I could be doing the teaching really, really well with a third of the work, but I copied the whole work anyway just because it was more convenient. Well, that's not a no, but, but let's look a little more closely, right? Um, use of commercial educational materials um, is again a, a sort of a caution flag area, but as Brandon's going to tell you in a few minutes, there are definitely moments right now where use of commercial educational materials is totally fine. So again, sort of ringing that bell, these are caution flags, not sort of brick walls or something. Um, and if you want to know more about all this stuff, the caution flags, the how it works, etc., uh, you can go to this link and see the full fair use uh, copyright basics workshop that we did earlier on. Um, but for now, I think I think the foundation has been laid pretty well. We can stop the boring stuff and let the superstars step up now. Um, the last thing I want to say is that despite these cautions uh, that we're sort of ending with here, I don't want to just end on a downer. Fair use clearly supports education in this moment of crisis and in the ongoing work of education, particularly rated, related to the topics that we talked about earlier. Uh, so to illustrate that, I'm pleased that we have two luminaries in John and Brandon to talk about two case studies in this area. Uh, in a minute, Brandon's going to talk about fair use in terms of scanning textbooks and emergency. Um, but now um, and Jonathan Band is going to talk about the Hathi decision as a case study for fair use as it's related to accessibility. And I'll let uh, Meredith make that introduction. Great, thank you so much, Will. Um, so as Will said, one case study we have that looks at questions about how you can make materials digitally available, um, how you can make scanned materials and uh, text recognized materials available for people um, is this case Hati Trust. And uh, John Band is gonna talk to us about that. John Band is a lawyer in private practice whose work focuses on copyright in the digital environment. Among his work, he regularly advises library organizations about copyright, fair use, and access for library patrons with disabilities. John, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, my pleasure. Um, so I'm gonna briefly talk about the Hathi Trust case and how it relates uh, to accessibility. So um, Hathi Trust was, uh, a con it is in fact, it still operates as a consortium of libraries, uh, a, a, a research library, so, so libraries uh, attached to uh, uh, universities. Um, uh, they were in partnership with Google, and you might remember the Google Books project, uh, and maybe you actually use uh, Google Books yourself um, from time to time. Uh, but but Hathi Trust was was sort of like a spin-off of the Google Books project, and in, and the, the the libraries that participated with Google in in sort of the digitization of the books, they ended up getting. Uh, digital copies, scans of all the books, and they maintained uh, this enormous database of 10 to 12 million scans of these books. Um, uh, they were sued by the Authors Guild, uh, which is a, an association that represents about 10,000 freelance authors. Um, you know, the case is very complicated, lots of twists and turns, ups and downs. Um, but ultimately, uh, the, 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 the court, uh, first at the district court level and then at the court of appeals level, they found that sort of Hathi Trust was a fair use. And what Hathi Trust did, sort of they, 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 they had several basic services. Uh, the, the core service was they just maintained copies of all these books and they allowed people to uh, do um, digital research, you know, digital humanities research, like word searches and that kind of thing. Um, uh, they, um, uh, but, but in response to a query, you wouldn't receive full text. Instead, you would receive simply a, an indication of what books contained that term, what page number in the books uh, contained that term, and where you could find the book. So it was sort of, um, but, but still, uh, Hathi Trust had to have all these copies and uh, multiple copies, backup copies. Whenever uh, a search was done, you'd have short-term copies. And the, the, the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit basically found all those copies to be perfectly okay, no problem. And again, we're talking uh, 10 to 12 million books uh, that were in the Hathi Trust database. More relevant to this conversation is 
uh, HathiTrust decided that it would provide the full text of these books to print disabled students on their campuses. So if you're a print disabled student at the University of Michigan, you would be able to have access to the full text of the books in the HathiTrust corpus. Um, and so, you, and, and, and initially it was just a read aloud function. I think they've added other functionalities since then. And the court uh, applying fair use found that that was perfectly okay. It was perfectly okay to make available the full text of 10 to 12 million books to students with uh, students and faculty members and authorized users uh, of these libraries. Uh, uh, and, and it's fortunate that the court relied on fair use. The court also could have relied on another exception, which is called uh, the, the Chafee Amendment at Section 121 of the Copyright Act, which, which allows authorized, what are called authorized entities, uh, which has a broad definition. It would also include libraries to make accessible format copies for students with print disabilities. Uh, so the court could have just relied on on uh, on that on um, uh, the Chafee Amendment. Fortunately, it chose instead to say, you know, it basically said, yeah, Chafee Amendment covers it, but it also says it's fair use, and it kind of did this four-part analysis that uh, we just were hearing about. Um, why it's so good that the court did the four-part analysis is that, and, and relied on fair use, is is the analysis the court did with respect to students with print disabilities applies with equal force to students with auditory disabilities or any other kind of disability. Um, uh, because the court was basically, the court, again, walking through the four factors, that, but, but in terms of transformation, it said, look, this is not a market that the publishers are serving. They've chosen not to serve this market. So converting the text to serve this market is a transformative use. And then with respect to the fourth factor, it's the same thing. So look, the publishers have chosen to abandon this market. They're not serving the market, serving the market. So no, there's no harm to the market. And, and then also with respect to the third factor, the amount, they said, look, it doesn't do the student any good if, if they only can have access to part of the text. If the whole text is assigned, they need access to the entire text. So, uh, uh, by, by relying on fair use rather than Hathi trust, we know that you know, we're not only limited to serving students with uh, print disabilities, we're able to serve students with all disabilities. Um, and so again, that's just a powerful example of the force of fair use. What's also important to, to recognize in, in terms of how you think about this is that the, there has been virtually no pushback from publishers with respect to the, this aspect of the decision, meaning they're, they're basically, you know, either, either because they realize from the, that, 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 that this is actually a good thing to serve people with, the, uh, with disabilities, or they realize that politically it would look horrible if they complained about uh, libraries and educational institutions making accessible copies. So this is an area where uh, there is little risk of opposition uh, from rights holders. And, uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but uh, thank you, John. That was really helpful. And I think it, it highlighted two absolutely crucial takeaways, which are using the whole work can absolutely be fair use and that the ability to meet the needs of students with disabilities is a flexible one that isn't dependent on any one technology or any one um, path to delivering the materials, but it is based on the needs of the students. So thank you again, John. And um, next up, I have the pleasure of introducing Brandon Butler. And um, uh, Brandon is the Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia Library where he focuses on intellectual property, copyright, licensing, and user privacy, among a host of other things. Thank you so much for joining us, Brandon.
Yeah, it's uh, it's really my pleasure to be here. Um, uh, nice to see John Ban growing his beard back. Um, you know, it just takes me right back. So, um, so yeah, it's wonderful to speak with you all. And I'm going to talk very quickly um, about this uh, sort of paradigm case in my mind of a non-transformative and yet still perfectly fair, fair use. In fact, when uh, I just answered a question in the q and A, is you know, what's an example of a transformative use and a non-transformative use? And, you know, sort of copying textbooks for use in courses is often my paradigm case of a non-transformative use. But at UVA, we found ourselves in a position where it was uh, both important, uh, urgent, and totally legit and fair uh, for us to have to scan textbooks. And so we did it and we were able to do it under fair use. So let me describe uh, what happened. Um, it all started with a bunch of stranded spring breakers and I looked for a, a safe for work uh, still from that movie and there isn't one. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, I don't know if it's even safe for me to recommend that you check it out. But anyway, Spring Breakers is a film. Uh, it's also what our college students were doing when um, the world really turned on its axis a little bit and um, lots of things changed. And so they were on spring break when our president, Jim Ryan, sent out an email that said, don't come back. Uh, we are closing down our physical campus. We want you to stay with your families or um, you know wherever it is you can safely go. And some folks had nowhere safely to go but campus. And of course, we welcome those folks back. But um, if possible, we ask people, you know, stay away from campus sort of a shelter in place. And, um, and then we tried to formulate a kind of uh, backup plan, right? And it was quickly decided that um, we would resume courses uh, online, like a lot of institution, we would, we would pivot to an online teaching model. And we would do that with kind of like a week um, of turnaround time. Um, we also knew that, uh, bless their hearts, uh, these students um, probably did not bring their textbooks with them to the beach, right? Um, or to wherever they had gone for spring break. We also knew uh, that, you know, we didn't want them to come back to the library and, and come looking for all the items that were on reserve there. Um, so that's where we were. You can't come here. We don't, you know, we, uh, you, we don't care if you go home, but you can't stay here and you've left your books and you can't have any of our books. So if we go to the next slide, what did we do? Um, well, again, some things to think about, right? One thing I would immediately do because I'm a hardcore champion and friend of OER, as I'm sure many of you all are, is uh, if time had allowed, I would have said, this is exactly you know, why you should be using OER instead of proprietary textbooks, because they're so flexible and easy to repurpose. Time did not allow, it was too late. These students were literally sort of two thirds of the way through a syllabus and they could not, the, the faculty members among all the other changes they were making, we couldn't possibly ask them to change their, their syllabus. Um, so there's no turning back, right? Students had already purchased materials. Again, we are two thirds you know, into the semester they've bought whatever they were going to buy. And, you know, so there's no, uh, there's no question that they've invested in these materials. The, the textbook publishers had made their profits if they were going to make any profits. Um, the materials on the physical reserve in the library are inaccessible, right? We shut down the library. No one was allowed to come. Um, there were free offers from textbook publishers. So Vital Source and Red Shelf, these kind of consolidator platforms that do e-textbooks, um, they were, uh, you know, to their credit, I mean, pretty quick in putting up um, free, free-ish and free, you know, data, data walled offerings, uh, by which I mean to say you could get their textbooks, uh, you could get some textbooks on those platforms for free, um, quote unquote, as in you didn't pay money, but of course, you had to create an account, you had to use their platform, uh, which means you were paying them with your data. They were learning about you, they were collecting information about you, um, which makes some people queasy, right? Um, and uh, the selection available on these free sites was ever-changing and certainly not comprehensive. Um, some folks didn't have the connectivity required and the consistent connectivity required to do an entirely online 
uh, textbook. We wanted them to be able to download and retain rather than have to have a persistent uh, data connection. So there are all kinds of reasons why these kind of free online offers weren't gonna cut it. Um, and then finally, there was just high time pressure. Teaching was resuming in just a matter of days. So given all those pressures, what could we do? Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, we had a compelling fair use argument. Um, you can use the four factors uh, to, to walk through these, right? Um, our purpose was educational, of course, and nonprofit, of course, but it's always those things. But what's interesting is we had a kind of uh, meta purpose as well, which was preventing death, right? Which is a pretty good purpose. Like, do not come here and infect us with whatever you got on spring break and do not come here and talk to us and meet other people who might infect you and so on, right? Which is just as compelling of a public policy kind of rationale as you could possibly want. Um, the nature of the work, right? Textbooks, mostly factual, might favor our use, but courts don't really care that much about that factor anyway. How much? Well, we tried, as I'll explain, to contain our scanning to what was appropriate to the purpose, which is what you always have to do in a fair use context, right? Um, so we instructed our instructors um, to make requests that were in line with what was going to be needed uh, for, the, for them to finish out the semester, which may not always be the entire book. And so we, were, we took opportunities where we could um, to tailor and to not provide entire copies if that wasn't what was needed. And then also, of course, we used our course uh, management system, which is accessible only to the folks who need it, right? So the enrolled students and the TAs and the other people who are involved in a course, um, which I'll talk a little bit about, about that on my last slide. And then finally, the effect on the market we knew would be negligible. That is the the world where there is no COVID-19 and this world, uh, you know, these students had already bought their books. They were, um, if anything, uh, vendors are increasingly offering these free versions. And so it wasn't like the vendors had decided this was their chance to get a windfall and profit off of all these kids that are stuck without access to their books. To the contrary, uh, the vendors had essentially announced that they had no intention of trying to profit from this, uh, which is great, which is good, um, as they should have. And even if they had announced that they'd like windfall profits, copyright and fair use doesn't require that we give them those windfall profits, right? So um, if we'll go to the next slide, that I think that's my last slide, I'll talk to you about how we tried to kind of uh, contain our scanning so that we were sure we were confident that what we were doing was okay. Um, the two main things that we did, um, uh, once we knew that in principle this would be okay, was that we tried to make sure that both the faculty making requests and the students receiving the scans understood what was going on and were in a position to make choices that were consistent with our goals, right? Um, and so faculty saw a pretty lengthy explanation of what's going on and that explanation included an, explain, an explanation that, you know, look, this is an emergency, right? So um, don't expect this to happen, you know, uh, our, our faculty are voracious scanners already. And so there was a sense that, look, we, we want you to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and so this is something we're doing now that we're not gonna probably do, uh, you know, in future semesters, depending on how this crisis continues to play out. Thanks, Brendan. Um, I had a couple of questions before we move on. Um, you talked about this a lot in a higher education context, but just to be clear, a lot of the people in this webinar yes. are in a K through 12 context. And can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what parts of this you think would be the same there, whether you think there's points of distinction, because in K through 12, a lot of students are home and they may have the materials they would normally have, but a lot of materials are delivered by teachers, they're living out in class, they may not be in the place they normally live. Can you talk yes. about the sort of parallels there? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yes, absolutely. So the, the key issue, and I think where the key parallel is going to be, um, is that fair use gives you the flexibility you need to ensure that um, when access is impaired sort of suddenly and unexpectedly uh, due to this kind of a health crisis, um, copyright is not going to be a reason that you have to, you know, uh, 
constrain the way that you um, create a policy to continue access for the duration of the crisis. And so the thinking back to my grade school days, I mean, as you say, Meredith. 10 years you know, ago. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's fresh in my mind. Um, uh, textbooks, were, textbooks were handed out uh, in school. There are handouts. There's lots of materials, right? And watching my kids come up through, my kids are both in elementary school. Um, there's lots of materials that are sort of distributed on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no reason to think that if you were going to distribute this as a handout in class, uh, that you couldn't distribute it then under fair use using a secure online platform. I think that's probably the key takeaway. Just as my students at UVA were stuck without access to the resources that we would ordinarily provide to them in person, so elementary school students are now stuck without that kind of access. And, um, and, and so the logic of the argument that I've made about you know, my spring breakers and their textbooks applies just as well, I would say, to all of the physical materials that you would normally have um, provided to your students uh, over the remainder of this school year. Great, thank you. And then the other thing I just wanted to highlight that you mentioned is, you know, these are actions that are being taken in this emergency this semester. And that as we think forward, fair use will also enable you to do some things to prepare for the fall semester and for the year ahead that is likely to be uncertain, but that the analysis will be a little bit different there. And so you'll have to think through not just that question of is this an emergency, but you'd have to think through as we'll set up a more full sort of fair use analysis of am I doing a new transformative thing? Could I do this every day in my classroom? And the answer to a lot of those questions is yes, but it's a different analysis. That's exactly right. Um, and so we'll be changing some of the things that we do over time uh, when it comes to this sort of uh, textbook scanning. But that's right, the, the transformative argument in particular is kind of evergreen. And so when you know that your use was going to be transformative and fair in, uh, in, a, in an in-person context, the reason that it's transformative is still going to apply in an online context. And so um, you should you should uh, move forward with great courage in that context. Thank you. And it would be hard to have a better encouragement to go forward than that. I also want to note that the next two Fridays, we're holding two more of these webinars. The first one will be on finding those open educational resources that Brandon mentioned. These are resources that are put out under an open copyright license so that you can always use them and distribute them for free they don't come with those copyright restrictions. And we'll talk about how to find those next Friday. And then the Friday after that, we'll talk about creating open educational resources, which often involves some reliance on fair use to think through including images and including excerpts. And those types of uses are the ones Brandon's talking about that are often transformative, regardless of when you are doing them for that teaching purpose. Thanks, Brandon, it's great to have yeah. you. Thanks, you guys. Um, up next, we have Professor Peter Yazi, who's going to talk a little bit about the ways in which social justice is one of the sort of core functions of fair use and how both now in the emergency and also going forward, that if you are doing um, things to attempt to reach all of your students, you're attempting to reach students with disabilities, you're attempting to reach students who are English language learners. Um, you're attempting to correct inequality in your students' ability to access materials that fair use supports and enables those goals. Um, we're gonna do this in conversation with some of our earlier speakers, but I do also want to report, we've got a lot of questions that have come in. So we can, we'll try to get through this, but also leave some space for questions put in the Q&A here and submitted earlier. So again, Peter Yazzi is my colleague at American University and a professor of copyright law, and we're very happy to have you. Thank you, Peter. Um, you're still muted, sorry. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, I, I want to get to the conversation and the questions as soon as possible. So let me just take two minutes to, to review the bidding. Um, we know that there's copyright. It's a ubiquitous, relatively long-lasting owner's right 
in lots of kinds of information. We don't worry so much about it for a variety of reasons in the face-to-face -face classroom. But as soon as we get beyond the face-to-face -face classroom, either because we want to be there or because we have to be there, as in the moment, it begins to look a little more mm, uh, threatening and 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 even frightening. And that's where this notion of the user's right of fair use comes in. If copyright is an owner's right, fair use, the the general flexible copyright exception is a user's right, and it's as broad and as flexible in its extension as copyright itself. In the short term, that means that copyright shouldn't be getting in the way of doing the things that need to be done this spring, this summer, next fall in the emergency. And we'll talk more about, we've heard just now from Brandon a good deal about how that is so. In the somewhat longer term, it means the existence of fair use as a central part of the scheme of copyright law means that copyright can actually do better than not getting in the way. Copyright can be, thanks to fair use, an engine for equity in access to information, and it can be the necessary support for developments such as open, flexible, resilient, adaptable, open educational resources. So we're going to talk today mainly about that short term. In future meetings of this webinar, we will cast our gaze forward. But I want to be clear, copyright has some, copyright shouldn't get in the way now, and copyright can actually help and enable progress in making our educational system fairer and more effective for all students in the future. Thank you, Peter. Um, so one question that we have seen that's come up a couple of times in um, situations like this are things that we can do to um, support people who are learning to read and support uh, learners who are learning English as a second language. And I was wondering, um, Peter and then Jenny, if you could join us, if we could talk through a couple of specific scenarios there. One question that we've gotten from the audience is, if you have students who are learning to read or who are have an uneven reading proficiency, is it fair use to make an audio version where a teacher is reading to students to accompany a print text that they already have to either help students who are English language learners or help students who may not have the same level of reading proficiency. Peter, can you talk about that uh, case? I can, I can. and I, I, I point out that, that in this webinar series, the very first one, which is archived, and which anyone who is interested can go back and look at, is all about the various sizes and flavors of reading aloud. The one that you describe, that is reading aloud and providing recordings of, of, of voice text to support not only the development of reading proficiency, but the development of other kinds of proficiencies as well. That is about as close to the, the sweet spot in the application of fair use to education beyond the face-to-face -face classroom as we're likely to get. It is clearly a new, educationally justified, transformative use with no real likely substitutional effect on the original materials, which have, after all, already been assigned. So it's a very good example of something which now and later, in the emergency and beyond the emergency, ought to feel comfortable for teachers. Thank you, Peter. Um, 
I'm going to just ask a couple of the other presenters to um, answer a few of these questions as we go forward. Another question that's been presented that maybe um, Jonathan, if you'd be willing to address, has been if uh, material was normally presented to a student in the classroom, but they, through a student's, a teacher's aid or through some other method in the classroom to make something accessible for students with disabilities, if new voiced copies or transcribed copies or materials like that need to be created to reach students with disabilities? I have sort of a two-part question. One is, does fair use support making copies of materials that are accessible for students? And then as a follow-on, um, does the law impose any specific limit on how those are delivered? So could those be downloadable or delivered to students in whatever format they need in order to make use of them fully? Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, I guess the, the answer, the way I would answer it is, is uh, you know, no and no. I mean, that there's no problem with, uh, with either of those situations, that fair use would allow um, uh, the making of those accessible copies. And uh, there's no, reason to you know there's nothing in the case law that right now would suggest that that the mode of delivery in any way is limited um i, I would say that again as a practical matter and peter alluded to this and, and as did brandon um you would you know, when you're doing any of these things of course you want to do them in as responsible a manner as possible and uh so so um you know it, obviously, it's better if you make things available in a secure way than in an insecure way. Um, and uh, you know, again, if if because of the, uh, uh, the 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 emergency situation and the the tech the technological limitations, either of the school on the one hand and the uh, student on the other hand, you know, that the only way to do it is to kind of upload it on an open website, then, then that's what, you know, then so be it. On the other hand, if there are uh, more secure platforms available that are workable, then it would be better to use those. And certainly, um, uh, you know, there is, uh, uh, in, in um, you know, it did come out in the, in, in the Authors Guild case and also the related, uh, in the Hathi Trust case and the related Google Books case when, with respect to the underlying search database, which the rights holders were complaining about, uh, and one of their arguments is as to why it wasn't fair use is that they, they were saying, oh, it's very risky, th th there could be leakage, and the court said, no, you know, they're using state-of-the-art security, it's not going to leak. And so I think to the extent possible, if there could be secure security, and I think, again, it's even though, you know, I know we've talked a little bit about the TEACH Act as opposed to the, you know, which is Section 110.2 as opposed to Section 110.1, and, and certainly I've been among many who've pointed out the limitations of TEACH, in particular the technological limitations, but the truth is now so many more institutions have different kinds of secure platforms that a lot of a lot of the concerns that we've had with the TEACH Act in the past are, are not as great as they used to be. I mean, there are other problems, but it's fewer problems. And so, uh, so, so to the extent that we can still rely on fair use as opposed to TEACH, yeah, it's always better, that, you know, the more security you're able to afford, the better the argument is gonna be that there's not gonna be any harm to the market of the rights holder. Thanks, and Peter, I know you had a-, a Yeah, just a really quick, quick thing because over you know 15 years of talking to teachers and librarians about these issues one of the things that I've discovered is that many people believe that if they act in good faith make digital materials available to their communities for a fair use purpose they're still somehow legally responsible if somehow those materials get divert it nevertheless and end up going to some kind of you know nefarious use and that's just wrong in other words the we we have quite a lot of law on this question 
and the good faith actor who engages in a fair use activity and releases digital materials that through no fault and not as the result of any encouragement or invitation of their own end up being misused may feel bad about it but they have no legal liability in connection with it. Thank you Peter and so I think the you know the takeaway from this discussion is that you can take whatever steps you need to meet the access requirements for students with disabilities and when reasonably possible you should do so in ways that limit that access to the intended students, but that the, there is no special legal requirement to ensure that it isn't reused, that you're supposed to sort of take your reasonable steps, but if that means in this case, you email it to a student or you put it somewhere on like an unlisted YouTube channel, that if that's the method you need to take to fulfill your purpose, that you don't need to worry about the possibility of someone else misusing it. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple questions about bandwidth and access. Um, Robert, would you be able to unmute and join us for a second? Yes, yeah, certainly, what are we hearing? So a number of questions are about any experience creating lower bandwidth versions of things, less um, high volume versions of things and delivering materials to students who don't have reliable bandwidth. You talked about setting up the technology but for a lot of districts who don't have that head start, they're trying to figure out what we can do at the sort of lower technology level. And maybe you could talk a little bit about the technology part of that, and then we can talk a little bit about how copyright law will let you do that. Yeah, certainly. I, I think some of the uh, things I've done with my teachers here, uh, both K all the way up to 12, um, really taking uh, materials that we own and taking anything that's image related out of those. Um, and so stripping out images, uh, sometimes uh, we're actually sharing text that is actually an image and not text, and that creates a larger file. Um, we can also do some things to take files and make them smaller. Um, you know, PDFs can sometimes be saved as uh, something that's smaller. Uh, so we've tried to accommodate that and then also making sure that we're not sharing, you know, a 19 page thing that we want kids to read two paragraphs of that we're doing things like chopping, copying, even if those are copying images of those things um, into another type of document and then anything we can do. Um, if we are saying that everyone has access if we can make it cloud based as opposed to something that sits uh, a little heavier on a machine. Um, sometimes that's um, that can go both ways, but maybe uh, maybe that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And Peter, just to follow up on that, from a copyright standpoint, um, if you have something that's like a flat scan of an image or a picture of text, and you need to translate it to deliver it in one of these higher resolution or lower bandwidth ways, is that something that in this situation copyright law would allow you to do? Absolutely so. I said earlier that, that copyright law, the owner's rights side of copyright law is, is ubiquitous and there are many ways in which at least as a technical matter, the kinds of, of clever and useful transformations of material that, that Bob is describing might be regulated by copyright. But on the other side, on the user's right side, on the fair use side of copyright, these activities are well calculated to achieve the desired transformative purpose, that is, teaching through the emergency or in the future, teaching to underserved student populations beyond the emergency. So the fact that these are technically regulated activities is only the first step in the analysis. The second step, and the step that gets you where you want to go now, and I would argue in the future, is the fair use calculus that we've discussed and that has been modeled already in so many situations by our previous speakers. Thank you, Peter. Um, Christina, I was hoping that you might be able to unmute and 
talk to us about a few questions about um, how to think about this current moment. One of the things, Christina, that I've seen you say um, online and in person a number of times <laughs> is that this isn't, it's a sort of misnomer to say that this is online teaching, that this is yeah. an emergency teaching. And, yeah. you know, we're getting a lot of questions about like, you know, does this need to be in the LMS? Does this need to be delivered in a way that is synchronous? Like all of that. And can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that students are facing that weren't prepared for online learning, that had none of the scaffold to get them ready for this type of learning? <laughs> yeah, this is actually an area where I feel um, we have a lot to learn from higher education because they've been doing online and learning a lot longer and they have a lot of folks that are specifically in roles such as instructional designers that help faculty members you know create really rich and robust and interactive learning experiences online versus simply digitizing um, and that is that is where we are right now in k-12 especially why i keep calling it more of emergency learning or triage learning uh, because we're not applying universal design of, of learning principles we're not necessarily applying like certain things that we know work really well to reach every learner um, in this whole process and so i know that some of the the words or the um the adjectives that, that have been thrown in front of the word learning right now <laughs> don't necessarily resonate because distance learning for example has been around from you know like the 80s and 90s when um when folks would watch a professor um teach and then they would write their paper and then send it in the old-fashioned mail um and that's been around for a while in distance education whenever i worked in in the state of nebraska we had schools in really rural areas that had um full like um systems like camera systems in a classroom where they would connect with a more um urban area that had different world languages or higher level math um that they couldn't hire in more rural areas and that was distance learning um and in a in a k-12 setting and so i keep saying in all of this to say like there are different ways of looking at this and what we're doing right now is not online learning um we are doing the best that we can and it's really important to know that this is what it looks like right now um do we have to really probably consider that in the fall we may not be going back to classes uh, like in person again we may and we may need to even look at um like you know considering fair use and copyright and more like openly licensed resources um so that we can quickly switch too so that we we get kids kind of um, scaffolded in providing all of these tools and these resources but that if we go to school uh, face to face but then all of a sudden, you know, we have more cases that jump in and we need to quickly pivot and go back to kind of this remote learning environment that we have the structure to do that. And then you're starting to see some of these plans come out of, of different cities and states that are thinking about this, of, of releasing some of the um, kind of the guidance on what it looks like to be sheltering in place. And I think that that we're actually going to have to think about that for K-12 even moving forward uh, this fall. Uh, that we're going to have to be able to have all of these things in place. And it's really hard to think about that when you are considering all of the vulnerable populations that we have we've addressed here. Can I ask you a follow up on that, Christina? Of course. Um, one of the things that you've mentioned before is the demand, the assumptions and the demands that it places on students to be available for synchronous real time classes yeah. and the ability to reliably have access to an LMS. So can you tell us like what just for the audience, what's the problem with sort of expecting students to be able to log online and sit there for an hour and listen to their teacher directly? Yeah, I think it just comes down to the fact that it's not feasible for us to expect kids to go to school at home. There are just too many external factors um, when we have kids that are worried about where their next meal is going to come from. We have kids that may not be in safe and, and secure kind of even physical spaces. Uh, so for them to simply turn on their cameras and, and turn on uh, welcome us into their home, that's also something that we're not necessarily considering. I've, I've seen quite a few things on social media about kids using virtual backgrounds and they're like, oh, it's just so stupid. Why are we allowing kids to do this? And I was like, no, because we're actually like in their homes and they may not want us in their homes. Um, so I think those are some things that we also have to consider in all of this. But um, overall, it's it's just not feasible. We cannot expect kids to do that. We 
we go through our days and we have transitions, whether that is in secondary where we have bells and we have kids that are moving in hallways and going, we're not having kids learn for six straight hours. I taught elementary and early childhood. We had transitions all day long <laughs> because you can't expect little ones to sit there for so long. So we can't expect them to do that at home either. So what I've seen is like, you know, thinking about all of the work um, that they should get a, be more or less be getting two to three hours per content area for the entire week. Um, and that can be spread out. But I, I think that's even, I mean, I think that's on the higher end. You can even cut that in half. And then once again, maybe even cut that again, because you don't want kids to be required to sit there um, synchronously. They need access to things outside of just always being on too. Thank you. So I think from a copyright standpoint, again, Peter, I would say, you know, what Christina is bringing up is that it might be necessary to record things and have them available for students on demand instead of having them be only available for students who are watching. And because students weren't prepared for that transition to online learning, not all students may be set up and able to log into the LMS. Does fair use allow us to be flexible in how we approach that? Absolutely. This is a classic example. I'm a very poignant one, and I'm very glad it came up. Um, we talked a moment ago about the attempt that uh, Congress made back in the early 90s to update copyright law to deal with what they then thought was distance learning. That's the so-called Teach Act that then found its way into Section 110. And one of the great limitations of the Teach Act is that it's conceived of entirely as a, an analog to the face-to-face -face classroom. That is, what, what, what authorization it gives educators, it gives them only for synchronous activities. So we have to look to fair use beyond that Teach Act to supplement and complement this inadequate specific exception. And there's nothing in the logic of fair use, as Will explained it so well, and as Brandon illustrated it in practice, that would or should make any distinction between the synchronous and the asynchronous modes. The fact is that what matters, what matters to educators first and foremost, and what matters to fair use is that the teacher or the presenter in question has made a good rational choice about what to do based on their desire to reach their students as, as broadly and as effectively as possible. And the asynchronous synchronous decision, the decision about whether to, whether to bring students into a virtual space or to send material out to them by whatever means is available, those are pedagogical choices which the law will support rather than impede. Thank you, Peter. Um, and so, Peter, um, I wanted to ask Will and Brandon, and then you, if you have also an additional opinion, a question that's come up a bunch in different versions in the Q&A, which is, a school has purchased a class set of a popular novel for fourth graders to read in an English language arts class. And so they purchased the set of books, they would normally be in the classroom for each student to read, but now the question is, would fair use permit that teacher to scan that novel and share it for that ongoing class discussion and close reading via an LMS. And um, I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but if you can just talk through how you would think through that fair use analysis. Um, well, would you like to, or Peter, I can, whoever, like Brandon, I've got my sort of panel of experts here, if anyone wants to jump in for the first word. I'll just, since I think Brandon's already said this really well, I'll, I'll say what he already said smartly, which is I think this is Brandon's scenario, except instead of textbooks, it's popular materials. So the fair use argument is strengthened, if anything, right? Because it's not, you know, necessarily a textbook, although it is still in some sense marketed for educational uses. So I, I, I think I'll just say ditto to Brandon and shut up, which is often a good policy for me. Hey, when, when Will's dittoing me, I know I'm on the right track. It feels good. Um, <laughs> And, and that's exactly right. And, and I will caught something that I think is quite perceptive too. I mean, your, your case is actually stronger, uh, arguably, because you're going to use this popular novel in an instructive context. And so you have arguably a fair use transformative argument and not just the kind of emergency argument that I described. Yeah. So 
I would say you're uh, even better off than. And I, I would only add to that that although the LMS in the question is great, if you've got it and if the students are comfortable with it and if using it doesn't create some inequity, doesn't leave someone out in the in terms of Kelly's important second question of the earlier presentation, that's great. But don't imagine that an LMS or the LMS equivalent is essential to putting that reading text into the hands of students. You're in a situation where it makes more sense to, to, to send it home on, on thumb drives than you do that. Thank you. So we're seeing here, yes, that it can be fair use. It is fair use in this situation if you have to take a material and scan it to provide access. But additionally, if you need to make a digitized version with character recognition for students who have print disabilities and need read aloud, if you have students who aren't, you can't reach through the LMS, that fair use is flexible enough to encompass those scenarios. Yes, and I want to make one point that I think is really important, and I know we have an upcoming webinar devoted to it alone, just as we have one devoted to the issue of, of equity and justice in the provision of education, and that is the point about universal design. Um, making sure that students have versatile digital texts of materials that it is important that they be able to read and discuss is of course essential from the standpoint of providing accessibility. But the wonderful thing about accessibility in, 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 or provisions for accessibility ranging from, from curb cuts to versatile digital texts is that they end up promoting the interests of a much wider range of people than the ones that they were originally created to serve. So rather than think about the, the idea of making sure that disabled students with, with visual or, or, or auditory disabilities have the appropriate versatile text that they need, rather than thinking about that as something that is limited in its scope and effect to them, the concept of universal design suggests that a much wider range of learners will benefit from that than we even know when those texts are first distributed. Thank you. Um, Judy, are you available with us? Can you unmute? We had, I had one more question I thought maybe you would be able to discuss. Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you. Um, Jenny, sort of sticking with that um, model of uh, scanning and creating a digital version of a novel that a class might read together, if you're dealing with students who are English language learners, you might provide some supports to help them um, access that text. Can you talk a little bit about what those supports might be that you might want to do if you're sending this home instead of going through the reading in class? Yes, definitely. I think there is a, a lot that you can do, particularly if you have text that is editable. So some of the things that we think about is integrating visuals into the text, chunking the text into sections. You, you might chunk it based on a particular topic and add um, uh, sort of make subsections. You can um, highlight vocabulary that you want to pre-teach. Um, or t or that you want to highlight while you're reading. Um, you want to you can highlight the vocabulary vocabulary in context along with the definition. Um, there is so those are sort of a few of the things that you can do in terms of the the strategies for editing the text. There's so many more. Some people change the language. Some people to make it you know um, to better address the grade level. Um, other folks uh, you know integrate you know. Um, um, in addition to that, might um, sort of chunk the sentences. So if the sentence is too long, they may make, might break it up into two sentences for younger learners, things like that. Thank you very much. Um, and we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna, instead of turning to Peter, I'm just gonna give you the, the answer. 
which I think hopefully everyone knows by now, is that fair use allows you to do these things if you need to, to meet your pedagogical purposes. And so that regardless of what the specific activity is, if you have a clear and defined pedagogical purpose for why you are doing this, and it is a, you know, a transformational use in this educational purpose, these are the types of uses that fair use is intended to and does permit. Um, and it is not specific to the emergency. Right. And so now we've come to our end of the hour and a half. Bill, and if you can take us to the very last slide um, that has the contact information for this project, we are um, running these every Friday uh, for the next uh, forever, it seems like. I think it's actually only the next five weeks. Um, but I wanted to end on one note, which is that we've talked a lot about um, the purposes, the pedagogical purposes that uh, different activities will serve. And I don't want to leave out that um, all of this that we've talked about is not limited to sort of dry pedagogy of like meeting the third grade math standards or meeting the, uh, you know, standardized testing requirements. That fair use also enables uh, using third party materials, doing read alouds to serve the social and emotional purposes of school. And we know that teachers are doing a huge amount of work now in this crisis to take care of students who are experiencing this emergency. And just as a huge part of teaching in the classroom is about the social and emotional care for your students that activities that you do to take care of students who are scared and to extend and tra translate the community of the classroom online are also enabled by fair use. And so I want to say thank you to all of the teachers who are doing that hard work. And I want to say that, you know, we get questions that are like, my students are scared. Can I read aloud to them via this platform to remind them that we're still here and their classroom community still exists and to give them an idea of continuity and it's important to remember that fair use enables that sort of community driven purpose in addition to the pedagogy ones so in the next few webinars we'll talk about how to find open materials that you can use going forward so materials that you can plan for in the fall when you know that teaching might be disrupted and materials that you can create as well. So please go and find about those. Thank you for coming. We've also had a few questions about um, certificates. If you attended in person and you need a certificate, you'll get a link in your uh, follow-up email that will let you do that. Thank you so much and hopefully we'll see you next Friday.